Hello, and thanks for watching another episode of ARFCOM News, your twice-weekly dose of the finest 2A propaganda. First up today is an update to the story we've been following about the FPC Brace Injunction. As you may have heard, the Fifth Circuit issued an injunction preventing the ATF from enforcing the new pistol brace law they made up under the authority they invented for themselves. The Firearms Policy Coalition was one of the plaintiffs in the case, so they sought clarification as to who was actually protected by the injunction. Survey said! <laughs> you yep, turns out the Fifth Circuit considers members of the FPC to be covered by the injunction. Except now, all the legal nerds are arguing in the various gun socials about whether the injunction applies to all FPC members, or just those who were members prior to January 31st of this year, because of some unfortunate wording in the motion for clarification. In its filing, the FPC asked whether members it represented since day one are considered members of the plaintiff group. So, some people are claiming that when the judge clarified that yes, members of the FPC and customers of Maxim are part of the plaintiff group, he only meant those who were members on day one. But it would be impossible for us to produce quality to a propaganda without sponsors. So before we dive in and figure out whether or not you can be protected by this injunction just by paying for an FPC membership like it's some kind of Konami cheat code, let's pay some bills. Today's video is sponsored by TNVC. Open weekdays till four, Saturday and Sunday they're closed online at TNVC.com. Now you have a friend in the night vision business. If you like seeing stuff more than not seeing stuff, take a look at our sponsor, TNVC.com, your source for quality night vision gear to make you the bump in the night. And by Gunstruction, it's like customizing your loadout in Call of Duty, but every single part actually exists in the real world, and it can tell you the exact cost and weight of your build before ever spending a penny. Links in the doobly-doo. Okay, so is an FPC membership basically the Konami cheat code for the ATF's stupid new rule? Well, the FPC is saying all its members are covered, and they retroactively declared everyone a member who donated at least $20 between the 1st of June last year through the end of May this year. But are they right? Well, first of all, once again, I am not a lawyer because fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to law school. But Washington gun law president William Kirk is a lawyer for the light side. I watched his video on the subject and it makes some really excellent points I intend to gloss right over here. So you should watch his video also. As always, we'll link that down below, but the short answer is no, probably not. The court probably didn't mean all members of the FPC, and no, donating $20 right now isn't likely to be some kind of magic legal cheat code. William Kirk mainly leans on this line in the clarification, which reads, any relief beyond what is explicitly requested, which arguably would be tantamount to a nationwide injunction, is denied. So his opinion is that you should indeed donate to the FPC, and yes, help them win this fight, and it's possible that doing so could give you some legal cover, but it probably won't. You should be donating to the FPC and the GOA, SAF, and every other worthy gun rights group because the FPC and those groups are going to smash this case and all those other cases not just because of some silly get out of jail free card. Considering the massive blow dealt by the Bruin decision and the numerous state level defeats suffered as the result, why would the Biden administration be eager to bring another 2A case to the Supreme Court? Because there are several cases in the pipeline which all relate to prohibited persons, and if the feds can push their favorite case to the front of the line, the other cases will be likely to be remanded to the lower courts to be decided again. The feds know there is no way out of arguing prohibited persons cases in general, so they cherry-picked a case where the defendant is a real ass-bag and violent criminal. Zaki Rahimi was arrested for... Five separate shootings. 
The court filing says Rahimi shot up somebody's house after he sold drugs to them, then got in a car wreck the next day, shot at the other driver, ran away, came back in another car, and shot the other driver's car. Then, a few days later, he shot a constable's vehicle, and a few days after that, blasted several rounds in the air when his friend's card was declined at Whataburger. The number of the day is five. But and none of that is what this case is actually about. Rahimi also had a restraining order against him <laughs> during all of his uh, rampage, and the case revolves around whether it is constitutional for a civil restraining order to revoke a person's right to bear arms. I want to point out here, if this case wins, it's not like the guy walks. It's one federal gun possession charge in a whole CVS receipt of local charges. The favorite case for the good guys is Range versus Garland, in which Brian Range was denied the right to buy a gun because 30 years ago he neglected to report lawn mowing income on a food stamp application and that mistake got him a felony conviction, which makes him a prohibited possessor. So, while the cases are legally and technically similar, the two people couldn't be more dissimilar. No one wants to say that a wife beater should be allowed to buy a gun, especially when confronted with the fact of what he chose to do with a gun that he got, and almost anyone would find Range to be a sympathetic character. Moreover, it is a lot easier to defend denying someone access to rights as a result of a currently active court order based on recent behavior and threats than it is to claim a dude is a credible threat to somebody because he lied to the government three decades ago. None of that ought to matter in deciding this case based on rights, but it does play a role. So, which course should the court take first? Well, from 2013 to 2017, there were almost 27,000 convictions for felons possessing a firearm, but only 121 for possessing a firearm while subject to a restraining order. So, which of these groups of people is in more need of relief from the court? And now, for your moment of zen. I gotta use lethal force, I mean. I hear you. They ain't, they ain't say nothing about not being able to set nobody on fire. Who are you, police, military, special forces? No, he's a crap cop at this one. Okay, say look. He said he got a flamethrower on this motherfucker. Flamethrower, AR. Hey friends, do you like pews and other pew related things? Do you want to help us keep delivering you pure uncut American pew propaganda at the low low price of free fitty? We literally couldn't pay the bills without our sponsors. So do yourself a solid, get yourself something nice from TNVC.com. You deserve it. While you're at it, check out Gunstruction and build your dream rifle without spending a penny. I love you. You get out of jail free. You should be donating. You should be donating to the FBI. <laughs>